We've been talking over the past few days about the importance of creating communities. And I just feel that Georgia Tech has organized a, a elaborate, collaborative, ambitious, engaged community right here. And I thank them. Um, I've been these, listening to these fascinating discussions about the future of the city, the depth of technological expertise, the breadth of excellent ideas, and the passion of the arguments and counter arguments have all been remarkable and frankly, a little bit intimidating. The future of cities has been for thousands of years the future of our civilization. And my Newsweek colleagues and I aren't experts in this field, to say the least. But it's clear from the sophisticated conversations I've heard and that we've been broadcasting to our global audience, as Deborah said, that we do have a role here. The disruption has already begun. What we've been talking about could be summarized as a set of crucial complicated choices that we need to make now. The news cycle, the modern news cycle, however, barely leaves room for instant analysis. Careful, nuanced reporting of important milestones in the road of human civilization is an almost unattainable goal. And yet the stories of these choices are actually all over the news right now, if you know where to look. And I have three examples I wanna share with you. So if you tried to catch an Uber to this conference today, you would have found yourself in the middle of a news story. Rideshare drivers in Atlanta are joining their coworkers across the United States and around the world in a strike to demand a fairer share of the profits that have made investors and executives in their com companies extremely wealthy. Their outrage, outrage was prompted by two giant IPOs, part of a wave of share sales expected to create 5,000 new technology millionaires this year. Okay, for comparison, it would take an Uber driver working 10 years of 80 hour weeks without a break to earn a million dollars. And even at that utterly unsustainable pace, the driver has to work two full years just to give Uber their share of the money. Now, that's an egregious injustice that needs an intervention, right? So here comes the intervention. If you fly into Phoenix next week and order a lift from the airport, you'll find yourself in the middle of another news story. An example of just this intervention, Lyft is partnering with Waymo to put driverless cars into its ride-sharing fleet and make them available via the Lyft app. So one way to avoid striking drivers is to replace them and make them obsolete with driverless cars. Most news outlets in America covered one or both of these stories, but few put them together. Because social justice and technological advancement are rarely covered by the same reporter, they're rarely seen as part of the same story. That's a challenge for journalism right now. So it's little wonder that the public largely embraced both the growth of ride sharing and the growing protests over income inequality without seeing that they were a facet of a single complex choice. All right, second example. Let's say you were to vacation in the Maldives. You'd find yourself in the middle of another news story and another complicated urban planning choice. Ten years ago, with anticipation building over a global climate deal in Copenhagen, the Prime Minister of the Maldives held a cabinet meeting underwater, literally signing documents beneath the waves of a lagoon with a coral reef as a backdrop for the news cameras. The Prime Minister was making a dramatic point. If climate change continued, his capital and much of his nation would be underwater in a couple of decades. The Prime Minister was pleading for help, not just on carbon emissions, but also for a sovereign wealth fund to help relocate his population to another country. The Maldivian government promised to do its part, to cut back on its own carbon footprint, mainly caused by tourists flying in to use the resorts. Okay, 2018, and with the United States pulling out of the Paris Climate Accord, the Maldives also made an about face. It opened a new international airport. You don't have to be a climate change skeptic to see the irony. Was this crass opportunism? Was it flip-flopping? Maybe it was an extraordinary contingency planning. If the climate models were wrong and your nation wasn't going to sink beneath the ocean, you might need a third airport. The news coverage wouldn't have helped you decide. Virtually all of the publications that covered the underwater cabinet meeting ignored the implications of the new airport. And many others, meanwhile, seized on the opening of the airport as literally concrete evidence that global warming was a myth. Third story, from my cold dead hands. Now when I say that, of course you think of Charlton Heston with his rifle and uh, NRA members. But it's also the slogan of a very different group of activists, the Human Driving Association. Their hands, in this case, are wrapped not around a gun, but a steering wheel. 
Their biggest fear, they say, is that human driving will be made illegal for safety reasons and that these resulting loss of autonomy, or rather the transfer of autonomy from a human to the machine, will make people less free and less human. The campaign was organized at events where only cars built between 1980 and 2000 are allowed. It sounds simplistic. It sounds reactionary. One of the organizers was, after all, a winner of the Cannonball Run, an illegal, gas-guzzling, coast-to-coast road race. But the ethical and sociological arguments around autonomous vehicles are not straightforward. What is clear and is that all the issues we've been discussing need to reach a wider audience. For example, the 40 million readers who come to Newsweek every month from around the globe. Newsweek has spent the better part of nine decades on a mission to give its readers carefully curated, nuanced views of the complicated stories just like these. This endeavor, essentially understanding the future of our civilization, not only requires strong reporting and deep expertise on each individual story about the future of cities, transportation, and technological disruptions. We need a sophisticated view of the whole future, the whole picture to help our readers and others make sense of the world that is already beginning to emerge. And that's why we're partnering with Georgia Tech to announce the Newsweek Next Momentum Awards an annual celebration of the people and cities propelling the world toward an environmentally sustainable, socially equitable, economically viable future of autonomous mobility and smart urban environments. Newsweek editors will work with the world-class experts here at Georgia Tech to convene an awards council over the summer and choose the honorees. The council, the nominees, and the global voting for the world's smartest city will be published in newsweek.com. The winners, that'll be five individuals and one city partnership, will be announced in the fall, and I'm sure we'll highlight some of the runners-up as well. And all of this will be both on our website with the 40 million viewers and in the magazine as well. I want to thank our colleagues at Georgia Tech, especially Deborah Lamb and Ellen Dunham-Jones, for being such inspiring and supportive partners in this exciting new venture. I look forward to hearing your nominees and seeing many of you in the fall. I think we have some winners right here in the room. And I wish you well with your work on the city of tomorrow. You're making news today. Thank you.